Introducing Emergentry, a preempt. You're up next. Can I have your attention, please? We're going to, we, we, I've been instructed we need to stay on schedule. So we will stay on schedule. So the first thing I want to announce is uh, we're going to do a change in order for this session only. And that has to do with Professor Conrad, who is here, who wanted this change. <laughs> well, we're going to go with the change anyways. <laughs> so. Um, So on your programs, <coughs> session three, which is on community applications, we are going to start with team 11, OcuSense, and then that will be followed in order by Sweet City, Sync Cycle, et cetera. So our first team, everybody ready here? Yeah. Okay, the first team we're going to hear today on uh, this session is team number 11, OcuSense. Thank you. Hi, we're Team OcuSense. I'm Crystal. Artem. Jerke. Alex. Uh, Miguel. And our customers are Professor Conrad and Professor Ishwar. Okay, so you guys might know us as the team that just stares at the door in the senior design lab and watches you guys come in and out. Um, but why do we do this? So commercial buildings like this consume a lot of energy just uh, pushing air throughout the building. And it makes up about 20 to 35% of electricity. And so the reality is that most rooms aren't occupied to full capacity. And it would be more efficient to adjust it based on the levels of occupancy. But unfortunately, HVAC systems run at the maximum no matter what. And this is extremely expensive. Um, with our occupancy sensing system, we provide real-time usage that will allow to save up to 10% of energy on buildings like this. So for pho photonics alone, it would save up to $100,000 a year, $150,000 a year, which is about 2.5 students' tuitions. So, um, <laughs> um, our project goal uh, was to create a reliable and accurate real-time occupancy sensing system that would be able to maintain the, the privacy of occupants while also being able to adjust in real-time HVAC systems to save more energy. Um, so this is kind of an image of the final product. We have two fully functional systems and two doors. And that's just kind of a visualization of the data flow and how it works. And we'll show a video now. Okay, so, so this is our sensor system above the door. 
Uh, as you can see, the white ball on top is the passive infrared sensor, and on the bottom is our thermal MLX 9621 sensor. Uh, inside, we have our Raspberry Pi 3 and our Arduino. And this is also a visualization of the heat map as Alex walks through the door. And even though it's only 64 pixels, you can pretty much see him as he like reaches his hand out. This is also a demonstration of our website working in real time as we enter the room. So it subtracts people as they leave. Um, and so this is our system. It's made out of, uh, it's a 3D printed case made in AutoCAD. And the reason we have this extra space here is for extra ventilation for the system because we also noticed that our uh, temperature variance went up when we put everything within the casing because it got very hot inside the system. So now that you've seen uh, kind of how it works, let me give you a, a real technical overview. So our system is kind of divided into three main parts. We have the data collection, the data processing, and the data monitoring. Uh, for the data collection, we're using, uh, as you saw, a thermal infrared sensor that has a 16 by 4 pixel thermal pilot array, which Miguel will talk more in detail later. That is connected through I2C to the Arduino, which s extracts the raw bytes from the sensor RAM and converts them into 64 temperatures in degrees Celsius and pushes the, those temperatures frame by frame to the Raspberry Pi via serial port. And the Raspberry Pi runs a detection algorithm, which kind of detects when a person is underneath the door and then what direction they're walking in, either in or out. And we send a plus or minus one to our Firebase data server, which hosts a client uh, user-friendly way to display the real-time occupancy and historical time occupancy of the room for you know, predicting room usage. And each individual door has this same system and they all work independently of each other and they're all put together by the web server. Now on to Miguel to explain in more detail why we picked the sensor. Um, so as you, as you know, our system is thermal based. So we needed to come up with a thermal sensor that fits all of our requirements. We landed on the Molexis 9621. Um, some of the reasons why we chose the Molexis is because the resolution, it's 16 by 4, as you can see in the image up there. It contours nicely to the door and minimizes um, sensing people walking past the door and not necessarily through the door. Um, it also maintains privacy since the resolution is so low. It doesn't use any camera technology. All of the occupants of the room's privacy is protected. You can't identify anyone from the heat maps. From, as you can see from the video. Also, the cost is low compared to the other thermal sensors that we looked at that met our requirements. Uh, some of the features include uh, 64 IR pixels and a PTAT sensor that takes the ambient temperature of the chip on uh, to, um, to uh, get the thermal readings. It, uh, it it has it can go from one to five hundred frames per second. We're currently at sixteen, but we have obviously a lot of room to go up if we need. We have a C plus plus class library uh, loaded onto the chip that does all the calculations and um, manipulates all the data to get the sixteen by four thermopile array that gets passed on the Raspberry Pi, which uh, Alex will talk about. All right. So, how do we actually count people in and out? Um, it required a lot of data analysis from the temperature frames. Um, this histograms uh, with green and blue represent hand-picked frames with uh, background and with persons in them. And as you can see, there's kind of a line where to the right, there's only people in frames, and then to the left, there's background. So we kind of developed this threshold to identify what frames correspond to background and what frames correspond to person. And as you can see on the other lower ones, those represent 750 frames where four people walk through. The variance is a little more stable, and that's what we're basing most of our algorithm on even though the temperature has also an effect. And we essentially, the frames that pass the threshold, the frames in the peaks, we run through a background subtraction and through uh, a little motion detection algorithm that detects the optical flow by looking where the hottest pixels are throughout the frames. OK, uh, this is our user interface that we created for our project. So as you can see on the website, it'll tell you the current and maximum occupancy for the room that you select. 
and it will also tell you all the sensors associated with that room, including its sensor ID, and you can turn it on or off or delete it, or as per request by our customers, we also have a feature to start recording the raw data so that it, uh, the algorithm can be improved in the future. And then you can also see a, hi a histogram of all the average occupancies uh, throughout the hour uh, basis on a day. And you can also create a sensor or a room and associate it. Um, this is just a rough overview of our database on Firebase. So as you can see, there's a collection of rooms and sensors that are associated together. And then there's also uh, all our data is stored in the date for um, is stored in a date array, and in that date array, there's an object that contains the value, which is a plus or minus one, whether someone entered or left, or a zero, which is a reset, which Yerke will be talking about later. But um, it also includes the sensor ID that caught the information and the time that it was uh, stored at. Uh, to make some sense of the data and to actually make sure that we, ne we can know these people, and there is enough difference between temperatures of people and temperatures of the background, we need to visualize this stuff. And that's why we pretty much have a uh, interpolated picture image of uh, 64 values. And as we can see, this is pretty clear that we can actually know these people. And uh, this like also allowed us to do a lot of useful things, like to understand that we can actually work very pretty close to each other in order to and we'll still be able to identify different people. And that like we're supposed to use actual variants, not like the differences because different rooms have different background temperatures that sometimes in winter people actually have lower uh, temperatures than the background. That was very useful for us. Uh, as Crystal said before, uh, we use PIR to uh, set the global resets on the server. So basically if uh, there is an event of uh, misinterpretation of some sort in the long run, say three hours, the people count will send to zero and um, uh, people account was set to zero, so the server uh, uh, will be reset. Uh, this is uh, to avoid some uh, un possible events that will occur. Uh, so the PIR that we choose is a wide-angle PIR sensor with a, a good detection angle and detection distance, and uh, also there is a low cost and low power advantage of that. Just to quickly conclude, um, we have a fully functional prototype that is about 80% accurate in individual walk-ins and walk-outs uh, over 10 hours of us sitting in the lab checking if it was good or not. And, you know, we just want to uh, say that it's it's prototype where to mass scale this, we'd create our own PCB and we'd make it more power consumption efficient and that this is ready to be deployed and for more research for our customers. And thank you. Any questions? How did you uh, settle on the IR array um, as opposed to like maybe a camera or maybe a simpler solution of like two lasers or something like that? Um, so a camera, we had to preserve uh, the privacy, so a camera was kind of a no-go. Was that a specific requirement? Yeah. Or? Oh, okay. Specific requirement for the project. Uh, in terms of the trip wires, we wanted something that was easily installable and something that when two people would walk in at the same time, we could still kind of detect. So this gives you like a lot of information with a, a low resolution and low cost. And we thought that was the best option. Hey, so uh, you, know, you mentioned that this is supposed to work in conjunction with a central HVAC system, right? So how do you envision for that system to communicate with your system? Will you have an API available or some other means? So we think through the web server, which kind of brings in together every like sensor, every data from the sensor, we could essentially do an API from, you know, the database and the server to the HVAC system so that the system knows how many people are in a room at any time and maybe even ends up predicting the room usage. Um, we, one of the things you mentioned was, was the cost of this system versus other systems. Like, how much does your system cost and then how much do competing professional systems? Um, so, uh, actually, there is a startup that charges $45 a month per door. Um, I forget the name now, but um, our, uh, so our system's like not really that cost effective right now because we have the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, but essentially we were to mass produce this 
would make our own PCB, and the idea is just to use a sensor, which is like about forty dollars. And you know, if you mass manufacture, it could bring the cost even further down. Wait, but but yeah. they're charging forty five a month. The, the, no, the oh, they. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. ours would cost just um, around eighty to a hundred just one time. Um, right now we're using an Arduino, but um, that's more just of a time constraint because it wouldn't. It was the only thing that would work with the thermal sensor. But eventually we would want to get rid of the Arduino and just work straight with a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. One more. Um, how would you improve the accuracy? So I think maybe even doing a machine learning algorithm or kind of adjusting the threshold more dynamically. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, funky stuff that goes on with people, like holding doors or just, like, playing around around the doors that affects a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that can be done. But Cool. Thank you. Um, so yeah, our project is for mainly air ventilation because um, that's something that, so heating and uh, cooling can be controlled via various different methods, but um, air ventilation is actually something that um, isn't dynamically changed based on the room occupancy. Yeah, so it's, it's focusing mainly on that part of the HVAC systems, not on the conditioning part of it. Okay, our, our next, uh, our next two projects, your mic's off, our next two projects, uh, our next two projects, our next two projects presented by Professor Pisano, our next two projects uh, are both sponsored by National Grid. The first one is team number 20, Sweet City. Hi, we're Sweet City and I'm Jessica. Jennifer. McKenna. Cameron. Steven and our customers are May, Jill, and Marissa from National Grid. So Sweet City is a safe, fun, and interactive Boston-themed exhibit. It is designed to educate National Grid customers on clean energy, energy efficiency, and their smart grid pilot program. As shown in our top-down view of our final product, we have four modules. From the top left, we have our energy efficiency model, and then we have our wind module, and then bottom left is our smart grid, and bottom right is our solar. Welcome to Sweet City, a fun, interactive, educational energy exhibit of the City of Boston designed for National Grid and their customers.
Here we start with the wind module, where a fan spins a wind turbine that powers a scale model of the iconic Sitgo sign. Next we move to the solar module, where users can vary solar output using filters. These filters, which simulate weather patterns, brighten or dim LEDs on the National Grid Liquid Natural Gas Tower in Dorchester. Now you can see the Boston cityscape, including the Prudential Tower. National Grid customers can separate a transmission line and simulate a blackout. The pilot smart grid program developed by National Grid reroutes power and quickly brings customers back online. We end our tour at Fenway Park, where users toggle between incandescent and LED stadium lights and see power consumption differences. So, the overall project is powered by 5 and 12 volt DC supplies as well as renewable energy resources. Um, we chose a Raspberry Pi model, uh, Raspberry Pi 3 as our microcontroller to um, execute all code for, for the project as well as control the module LCD screens. So we have three 16 by 2 pixel displays on our, each on our energy efficiency model, module, solar module, and wind module to display all, all module data and one three and a half inch touchscreen display on the smart grid module, which shows an overall, um, overall project summary as well as the smart grid data itself. So there, there are four separate circuits, um, all designed with safety in mind. So the solar circuit requires uh, two, two series solar panels to power a visual load um, and then we go to our wind circuit, which has which use, utilizes a summing amplifier with two Raspberry Pi out output pins to power a, an LED model of the Citgo sign. The energy efficiency circuit uses P and N type transistors to toggle between LED and incandescent uh, lights, stadium lights uh, at Fenway Park. And the smart grid module uses four quadrants of LED, uh, current limited LEDs to power uh, buildings throughout Boston. For the software portion of our project, it comprises mostly of programming Raspberry Pis to read data and simulate the smart grid blackout response. For the solar and wind modules, we need to read the power generated from our solar panel and our wind turbines. And to do this, we use an analog to digital converter and a rotary encoder. And we program our pies to read data from these. And then with this data, we will scale it up to realistic values for our model city. And then we will display these on our LCDs. For our smart grid module, we need to detect when a blackout occurs. And this is done using a transmission line. When the transmission line is disconnected, then the Raspberry Pi will know that a blackout is occurring and it will shut off all power to our buildings. After a short delay, it will slowly turn on the power, which shows the rerouting of the power. And the power of the last quadrant will stay off until the transmission line is reconnected. In addition, we have Bluetooth functionality between the solar and wind Pi and the smart grid Pi. The solar and wind Pis will send their data to the smart grid Pi so that we can display these values onto the GUI that Jen will talk about. So as Cameron said earlier, the displays for the solar, wind, and energy efficiency modules are made up of 16 by 2 LCD screens. Uh, the solar and wind module displays uh, display the power generated by the solar panel and the wind turbines. And for the energy efficiency module, it displays the power consumed by the LEDs and incandescents in our mod model of Fenway. Uh, the smart grid screen is made up of two different screens. Uh, the first screen is the data for the smart grid as shown above. And it displays the total number of customers in the smart grid city. And when a blackout occurs, it'll show the number of customers out and will time the length of the blackout. Uh, the screen below is the summary screen of the of uh, data for the entire project as a whole. So Boston Need will be the data for the whole project. Uh, renewable contribution will be the data from uh, the solar and wind modules, and percent green will be the calculation of renewable energy over Boston Need. 
I was in charge of the overall physical interactive deliverables for this project. Um, I made CAD models or CAD designs in SOLIDWORKS of everything I made. We had a 30 pound weight requirement that we had to meet, so I decided to make the box out of 80-20 one inch aluminum extrusion and enclose that with acrylic. I milled the wind turbine stands and the light stands. The light stand had to be a specific height to maximize the amount of light hitting the solar panels. I 3D printed wind turbines, different sizes and different shapes to vary power output. And then I laser cut the Sitco sign in the roads and the buildings. And I helped McKenna with the overall aesthetics of this project. So I designed and constructed a model of Fenway Park based on dimensions of other Boston landmarks. Um, I made it out of styrofoam to keep it lightweight and use real pictures of Fenway to make it look as realistic as possible. Uh, I also laser cut acrylic to make the stadium lighting to house the incandescent and LED bulbs. I was also in charge of the overall design of the project for which I made little miniature models of cars and charging stations as well as put together and placed the other city and suburban elements to make the project look cohesive and complete. So the project will be placed in National Grid Sustainab Sustainability Hub in Worcester over the next two weeks or so, um, so where it will have its permanent residency. So thank you very much to National Grid and all our contacts. So this looks uh, super interesting, like something I, I would expect to see in like the Museum of Science or something like that to help uh, to help get kids like more interested. It looks like you have a couple components, but have you thought about other ways that you could extend the project to make it more interactive to get kids more interested in the, the concept of green energy and how we could use it in the city? Um, there were a few other things that we weren't able to implement just because of time like we wanted. So right now we have a fan blowing out a wind turbine, but we really wanted to add another one where you could spin it with your hand so that they could like see, is that kind of what you meant? Like yeah, that like, aspect? like other ways you could like use like what you've built to extend it. We also kind of thought about for like Fenway using the extra power that we got from the LEDs instead of using the incandescents to maybe power something like the Green Line train or something, but we just ran out of time. Okay, our, our next, uh, next uh, National Grid project is uh, team number 21, Sync Cycle. Hi. <laughs> uh, so as Professor Fontana said, we're team number 21, Sync Cycle. Uh, our product is also for the National Grid, and our clients are also Marissa, Jill, and May. So uh, well, let's just get started. Uh, I'm Vinay Krishnan. We have uh, Moises, David, Gavin, and Samir. Let's go. So a quick overview. What is the sync cycle? As our esteemed professor, uh, Fisana, has put during our um, functional testing, it's a mean green bicycle m machine. Translation, it's an electric tandem bicycle for National Grid for their sustainability hub located out in Booster. It was originally designed for a, uh, to provide a hands-on demonstration for all the users that come into the hub so that they can understand and appreciate the um, impact that they have on the environment by choosing to take an alternative like our bike over a car. Um, so just to promote the sustainability uh, initiative that National Grid has been working towards. Uh, it includes a whole bunch of features that we'll be discussing in this presentation, and some of them are uh, onboard navigation, cruise control, 
a cross-platform mobile application, so it works on Android and iOS, um, and a data display to show back all the data that we've collected through our sensors. So here's a quick video to, if I can get it to play. We seem to be facing technical difficulties, so just give us one second and we'll have the video up and running. <laughs> data display that's uh, available on the website uh, where users can log back, uh, come back to the uh, sustainability hub and view the metrics of the ride that they just took. So let's continue. So as we have seen, as we have seen, we have a tandem, uh, tandem bicycle, standard tandem bicycle, onto which we have mounted an electric motor and a battery. Um, our data metrics are taken care of by our Raspberry Pi 3, our Arduino Uno controls, the cruise control functionality. We have a tactile and user-friendly um, switch, which engages the cruise control. And our solar panel um, powers, or assists in powering the, both the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. Uh, and with regards to software, uh, we split it into three main things. Uh, the cross-platform mobile app, um, which is being made in uh, Xamarin, um, so that we can have it both on iOS and Android while just writing one application. Uh, and we're targeting Android's API 23 and uh, minimum iOS 6. Um, and then for the onboard application, we made that in Node.js um, with uh, some Node modules like Express for our web server REST API, Blenno for our Bluetooth communications with the phones, um, a MongoDB driver to access our database, and on-off for GPIO. Uh, the web page is uh, using D3 to make charts and jQuery to, I guess, arrange the page. And MongoDB is what we're using to store all the data uh, collected on rides. Uh, and so my um, contribution to this project, uh, I, I made a lot of the designs uh, with regards to the structure of um, each application and uh, the design of the schema for MongoDB. Um, and on Node.js, I made the uh, REST API uh, libraries for the uh, GPIO and um, MongoDB uh, uh, access, and a state machine for our, I guess, ride uh, lifecycle manager. Uh, and for Xamarin, I did a lot of the work for the, um, I guess, behind the scenes uh, Bluetooth handler and then the data handler that would uh, shuffle information around. Uh, the part of the project that I was involved with was navigation and the Bluetooth server that's running on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, one of the requirements of this project was to create an on, uh, was to give the users a way to navigate in and around the booster area and hit uh, the local points of interest. We were given a, a list of points of interest by our clients, uh, which we have mapped as pins onto the homepage of the application, which you can see for both the iOS and the Android. Uh, the user, uh, when they open up the app, this is the homepage of the application, they just click on the pin they want to navigate to, double tap it, It'll open up the native uh, maps uh, uh, application on the device and uh, navigate them from there. So on Google, it'll open Google Maps. On Apple phones, it'll open Apple Maps. And um, it'll take you to the turn-by-turn -turn, um, navigation. 
Uh, we use the open URM method to accomplish this, but we also use this to uh, set up emergency contact information so that at the tap of a button, they, it'll open up the dialer of the uh, native uh, phone that it's on, depending on the target, and uh, immediately call either 911 or um, the number for the National Grid Sustainability Hub, uh, depending on who you want to contact. Uh, in terms of the Bluetooth server, uh, we created uh, a Bluetooth Low Energy server on the Raspberry Pi so that we can transmit the data and metrics calculated and collected by the Raspberry Pi to the uh, application in real time. So the users can, as they're riding the bike, they can see the impact they're having, uh, how much distance they've traveled, how much carbon emissions avoided, and other such metrics. Uh, so for my portion of the project, uh, I worked on the data display view and also the cruise control. Um, so first for the data display, it's a web page running on localhost on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, when users return to the sustainability hub, they can plug in the Raspberry Pi to any of the monitors, and they'll be able to view the data for the rides that they took. Um, that ride can be selected from that drop-down menu on the left. Uh, it uses D3, jQuery, and Bootstrap for charting, obtaining data, and formatting, respectively, as David mentioned. Uh, for the cruise control, we implemented a PID control system on Arduino Uno. It takes f the instantaneous speed, and when the cruise control is flipped, it'll take that current speed and use it as a set point and try and achieve that speed and maintain it through this PID controller. On the hardware side of the aisle, at least for the cruise control, uh, our focus, our point of interest was the controller that came with our electric motor and battery kit. And with, however, readily, little readily available information on the controller, I set out to investigate uh, the controller more. And originally, the way the, the motor would work is there was a thumb throttle that would, when pressed, send a variable analog voltage uh, using a hall sensor and a magnet to the controller to drive the motor, to start the motor. Um, we, rep we replaced that with um, our Arduino Uno, uh, which similarly sends a signal to the controller um, based on the speed that was, uh, the bike was going on. At the moment, the user pressed the, cr the cruise control button, um, and it begins cruising. Uh, the speed is uh, detected via a read sensor and a magnet. Uh, and I worked on implementing a solar panel and uh, power management system so that we could power the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I set up a solar panel on the back uh, along with a power management chip and a booster chip that takes, uh, takes the energy from you know, solar energy and uh, outputs a current that charges a battery. And the external battery is there so that I can store the energy so that even in conditions that aren't optimal uh, outside, like if it's a cloudy day like today, or if you want to take it out at night or, you know, just uh, in stationary mode and indoors, the light isn't enough. Uh, the external battery stores all that extra energy and uh, ch runs the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi, uh, which uh, obviously are the brains of the, you know, the whole bike. So we need those to be consistently on. So the battery and solar panel working together keep it uh, on the entire time. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, Sync Cycle is basically a tool uh, that we hope is used um, for further promoting and demonstrating National Grid's efforts in sustainability and renewable energy technologies and initiatives. Uh, it also provides a very fun and interactive way for the Sustainability Hub customers to in journey around Worcester and see all the sites. Um, after uh, successful testing here in Boston, uh, we are now ready to send this over to Worcester so they can now use it um, in the city of Worcester. Uh, uh, we have the bike here with us today to demonstrate, uh, so you can check that out this afternoon. Uh, finally, we'd like to thank National Grid, specifically our clients, uh, Marissa, Jill, and May, for providing us with not only the project itself, but also the necessary additional funding that we um, needed along the way. Uh, we had a great time working on this project, uh, as well as riding the sync cycle around campus, and so we hope visitors of the Sustainability Hub um, take as much enjoyment out of it as we did. Uh, yeah, that's it from us. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Maybe I missed this in the beginning, but uh, why a tandem bicycle? <laughs> 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 okay, so we had a pool going because we knew that was going to be the first question we are going to be asked. Um, Do I win? We, we don't know why a tandem bicycle, but it was one of the requirements that we were given, but I'm assuming it's because it's more fun with friends. 
Um, sure. The sustainability, the, the sustainability hub actually has two single rider bicycles that are kind of using the same thing with the electric motor and stuff like that. And so um, National Grid came up to us and they said that we wanted a sort of a tandem bicycle where two people can ride around and tour Worcester as you know together. It was more of a, um, I guess, more fun fun with friends kind of thing. So yeah. Okay. Just said yeah. Any other questions? How many times is that question asked? <laughs> Why the window? Thank you. Thank you. I'll probably throw the mic back in there. <laughs> no, I'll take the mic back home as a souvenir. Introducing Emergentry, a preempt. Okay, our next, uh, next team in this session is team number 14, Emergent Tree Prediction of Toppling Trees During Storms. Hello, everyone. We're Emergent Tree. I'm Sparge, Brian, Alan, Nick, and Ethan. Our project was inspired by Professor Amar because he had trees that fell down in his, near his home, and that raised some concern for him. And the thing is, falling trees is the most common cause for automobile damage, and unfortunately, there's no available solution for like a preempt, no solution to predict or prevent you know, such tree damage. So our objective was to create a, a our objective was to um, develop, a, um, alleviate a physical, alleviate the physical and financial risk by developing a system which uses a combination of algorithms, meteorological data, wireless communication, and embedded hardware. And now we have a nice... <laughs> we want to show the video. <laughs> Introducing Emergent Tree a preemptive solution that allows property owners to analyze and predict their tree's potential to cause damage. Simply place our weatherproof sensor on your tree to begin tracking its movements. This device consists of a polycarbonate case and a tracking unit which regularly uploads data to the cloud. Our in-home touchscreen device allows the user to connect to their tree like never before. A simple dashboard provides the essential vitals of your tree and important environmental factors. Here, you can explore current risk assessment results, as well as historical data, weather information, and alerts. To help our algorithm diagnose your tree, you can record additional signs of decay so that no leaf is left unturned. If your tree is at risk of falling or causing damage, we provide live text alerts to help you stay connected. Emergent Tree aims to provide an accurate and seamless solution that will allow any property owner to feel safe and informed about their tree. So here's an example of how our system will be implemented at a home. Our system consists of two components. First, 
is the branch pi, which is on, okay. <laughs> the first is a branch pi, which is a system that's on the tree, and it's connected through the in-house Wi-Fi and the internet, and then the second system is a home pi, which is a, basically a touchscreen weather station that's plugged into the wall and is connected to our alarm unit. So there's two separate components, and I'm going to first break down the branch pi. The branch pi is a Raspberry Pi coupled with an accelerometer and gyroscope that collects data about the tree's movement over time. This is paired with the Sleepy Pi, which is an independently powered RTC timer that allows the, us to manage the power of the pi by turning it on and off throughout the day. This is also paired with a high-capacity rechargeable battery with voltage IQ technology, providing the optimal amount of voltage needed for our device over time. So we collect this data and then upload it to the, the cloud for our Amazon AWS S3 database. This is then transferred to the home pie, which pulls the data from the cloud and pulls the current weather advisories and data to evaluate a risk assessment. We've analyzed the weather advisories for the past 20 years to determine the amount of property damage each one causes. We then use this as a scaling factor to scale the risk accordingly. So we take this risk factor and provide it to the front end where there's an external monitor where the user can interact and understand the data further. In addition, we have a, in addition, we have a buzzer and SMS <laughs> technology so the user can be anywhere in their house and receive notifications or on the go. So to achieve this, we have a simple workflow consisting of six steps. The first three is simply collecting and transferring data to the cloud. And the second three consists of doing statistical analysis on the data we collect finding the correlation between the tree's movement and wind speed over time to have a final risk assessment that the user can understand. And now Nick's going to go further into this for you. Okay, so whoops. we're going to dive into kind of like just a demonstration of, of, of how this works. So we went through a couple of iterations trying to figure out, all right, how can you predict whether a tree is going to fall? And this is kind of what we settled on. So given a tree, at a <laughs> that's a tree, at any given moment in time, there is some wind acting on that tree. And depending on how strong that wind is, it's going to move a little bit. And that's kind of what we're initially tracking, is uh, the movement of the tree versus a given wind speed. Uh, and so we plot that there. And over time, we start to generate uh, a scatter plot, mapping the movement of a tree for a given wind speed. And after uh, a certain period where we've collected a good amount of data, we begin to, we run a, a linear regression model on this data set, and that's, that generates a slope, and that slope represents the correlation between wind speed and tree movement. Um, so we know how much is, it's moving given uh, uh, how, what, the, what the wind speed is. Um, the key here is we're, we're actually tracking this slope over time. We're seeing how this relationship changes. So this is, this is that. Um, we, we plot those slopes over time. We standardize the data set. And we actually run a linear regression model on that as well. Uh, so slope uh, M1. Uh, now that represents the rate of change of abnormal and excessive movement. So if this is positive, that means the tree is moving more over time. And that's not good. And depending on uh, how steep that slope is, that means it's changing at a, a greater pace. And that's not too great. So we combine this with the current weather advisories um, to determine uh, the current risk category for a tree. So this kind of breaks down the, the workflow of this, the timing and everything. Um, the key, theor key thing here to note is that we just kind of break up the days into six-hour intervals, and that allows us to send packets of data every six hours and uh, helps us with organization on the back end, uh, coordinating data and all that. And so I also worked on the front end here. Um, so to the left, we have a graph that shows the current trend in abnormal and excessive movement. We break up the categories uh, into, into five, five main categories, uh, for ranging from minimal to extreme, and that's highlighted there. Uh, on the right, we have the, you know, the date, current weather information. We have how much the tree has shifted over, uh, by, by the angle. Uh, we also have the current risk assessment and uh, some other alerts over there, like battery information, weather advisories, et cetera. Uh, there's also a user input page where, as you saw in the video, people can put in uh, signs of decay that we've determined cause your, your, uh, your tree to uh, um, be at risk of falling. 
So what I focused on was incorporating the Amazon Web Services. We use two specific uh, services from AWS. One simple storage service is also known as S3 to transfer the data from the branch pie to the cloud and the cloud to the home pie. This was done by installing some AWS libraries on the Raspberry Pi in addition to writing to some Python scripts. Uh, second thing we did was using simple notification service. This allowed us to send the SMS message via the cloud and we use these text messages to um, have an alert system. When your tree is at a higher risk, we will send you a text message once and we won't send it every minute because no one likes getting spammed. And when it gets to extreme risk, we'll still send a text message in addition to having a physical alarm that's attached to the home pie. Um, that is used for uh, people to find immediate safety. Yeah. To get the most use out of uh, our branch pie, we use two products. Uh, uh, the first product we used was uh, Ank Power Core uh, Portable Charger and second was Sleepy Pi 2. Uh, the battery charger uh, is the densest battery we can find because it, uh, allo it allows us to capitalize both on space and for the longest amount of time. Uh, it also inco incorporates uh, uh, power IQ, uh, which will regulate the output power. Uh, emitting only the needed amount. Uh, also, the Sleepy Pi 2 uh, will cycle uh, through branch uh, Pi power. Uh, also, through our development, we realized the need of uh, RTC timer, which our Raspberry Pi didn't have. So our Sleepy Pi 2 will have some uh, RTC timer built in. So to get our weather data, we use two different APIs. First one is the open met weather map which got our hourly weather data, like high temperature, low temperature, wind speed direction, and just a description like cloudy or rainy. And the second one, Aries Weather, was specifically for our weather advisories. So Aries Weather API would send back um, information if there was an, a weather advisory within a 50 mile radius of our branch pie. And lastly, since our case is gonna be, out, our product's gonna be outside on the tree, we used a polycarbonate case because of its high impact resistance it's a great insulator, and it's also waterproof, and it also allows uh, easy application to the tree. Uh, lastly, during our customer installation, we managed to meet all of the requirements that he set out during September. Any questions? Did you guys uh, explore any different options for uh, tracking the the tree movement over time, like other than accelerometer and gyroscope? Perhaps like a camera? Um, we, so we, we looked at the, uh, the we, we thought movement of the tree was, was uh, kind of the biggest factor there. We, we were exploring other ways to track, um, not necessarily the movement, but other environmental factors that, that could affect it, like the, the, the state of the soil around it. We, we were also looking at how the type of tree could affect it, the age of the tree, uh, the type of bark, and um, we eventually settled on the model that kind of doesn't assume anything about the tree. It just builds a statistical model um, based, based around anything it's on, essentially. Uh, what about specifically the choice of using an accelerometer and gyroscope as opposed to like a video feed where you could track multiple trees? Um, we, we talked about that too. I think our initial requirement uh, from, from our customer was uh, to have a sensor uh, on the tree. But we did talk about perhaps having a, a camera or something and using machine learning to, to figure out. But I think the initial requirement was. And also a big thing was power consumption for us. So at Accelomometer, you just use I2C and it's very low power consumption compared to a video or something. Because like during long seasons, we want to make sure you don't have to constantly change the battery. Hopefully do it once like every three months at least. So. That's what we're trying to aim for with that. Okay. One of the check. Um, so I, I had two questions. Uh, do you have a, a cost model for how much it costs to keep a, a tree monitored for like a month? Like power wise or? Like, like no, like dollars. Like how like, many dollars does it I mean, cost I, you? Our product's about two hundred dollars to make, including the home pie, which is like I think the big, biggest expense is the screen, the touch screen that we use. But it was two hundred dollars over. And then the cost of AWS. Per, um, we use the free tier for this. Um, we're hoping, as you scale, we can get like the, the, the corporate model for it. Gotcha. So. Okay. 
Uh, and then the second question is, uh, you have all that weather data. What kind of data structure do you use to store all the the weather data? Um, JSON? We, Never mind. Yeah, we, we, jokes, we joke, the, joke's gone. Okay. Joke's gone. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a red black tree. A tree. <laughs> Maybe you have a decision tree. Never. Mind. I tried. Appreciated. All right. So I have another another question here. Um, does this track other types of weather, like snow or ice, accumulating on the tree, and maybe that tree falling because of the ex extra weight? When we put on the tree, we get like the initial angle of our sensor. And then if we see that angle, like that's like our base angle that we're making the reading off of. And if we see it like increasing over time, we it's uh, put into our risk assessment thing. And then like if it's over, so like if there was a lot of snow on it and it moves, like you see a tree like that, yeah. we. So basically we take the initial angle and then read off of that. Cool. And how critical is it to put your sensor on the or is it critical to put a sensor in a special area on the tree in order to track it fully? Or do you need multiple sensors for multiple large branches? Uh, have you done a study on that? So we kind of decided, uh, we haven't really done that much of a study, but I think like on the two large <coughs> limbs where like we would put both of our sensors. Thanks. Uh, no. <laughs> short, short answer. Um, long answer is um, we, we kind of, we put it on tree-like things uh, and moved it. And so, so the time scale is about six hours. And if we really wanted to test this, um, given we, we would need a larger time frame, basically. But what we did for, for testing was we kind of shortened it. So instead of every six hours, it sends data every six minutes. And we kind of manipulated the tree, changed the weather information, and we, we got pretty accurate results that way. But ideally, we would stick this on a tree, uh, wait a couple of months, and, and see if our results are. But yeah, there's, there's no data out there. We looked through the city of Boston to see if they had data about uh, how trees act when they're about to fall. But yeah, unfortunately, we just didn't have enough time. All right, next uh, team in this session is team number 15, Goose By. All right, hi everybody, we're team Goose By, team 15. Uh, I'm Nick, this is Keyshawn, David, Nadia, and Sharar. Uh, our customer, Professor Shale Grace from the Mechanical Engineering Department, is a local soccer coach at a local uh, school just outside of Boston. And one of the biggest issues they have at the school is geese all over the fields, and they just make a giant mess. So she came to us with the idea of creating an autonomous robotic scarecrow system. She kind of left it open from there. She said, you could use a Roomba-like device to kind of scour the fields looking for geese, scaring them away, or you could go with an aerial solution. But she wanted it to be safe, reliable, have some type of feedback method, be able to be disabled, and most importantly, not chase like kids or dogs or something like that. So what we went with was we decided on using the aerial option, so we picked a drone. So basically, our system uh, it consists of about four, four uh, kind of modules. It has a hanger to house the drone. It, it runs a DJI Phantom 3 drone. It has a Raspberry Pi and camera module, which are used to look at the field at all times and uh, determine when there are geese present. And also an iOS application, 
which allows the user to set various system parameters as well as disable the system in case there's a practice or something going on in the field. Hey guys, uh, I'm just going to talk about each of our components in a little more detail. Uh, so to start things off, I'll talk about our Raspberry Pi camera module. Uh, we basically set that up on the field. It periodically takes images of the field, uh, basically uploads it to Amazon Recognition Services, uh, determines if they're geese, and if they are, they'll, uh, it'll calculate the locations of those geese and send it to the iOS application. Uh, so the iOS application was my part, um, and what it does is it'll read in geese locations from the Raspberry Pi, um, basically calculate coordinates based on those locations, and uh, command the drone to go on a waypoint mission. And uh, Sharar is going to talk about waypoint missions in a few minutes. Uh, so the third component is the hangar. Uh, so that was one of the requirements from our customer. Uh, she wanted a docking station basically for the drone case of bad weather, theft, things like that. Um, and of course the drone is the fourth component. Um, and so we use the DJI Phantom uh, 3 Professional. Uh, it has a very large mobile library, so you can add a lot of functionality to your mobile application to command it. Um, and so we use that to disrupt the geese uh, on the field. To demonstrate the capability of GooseBuy, we set up the camera system to oversee the field and place the drone in a corner of the field. We changed the parameters on the camera system to recognize orange cones instead of geese. We placed cones in different quadrants of the field for the drone to go to. We captured a time lapse of the system performing multiple sweeps while the cones were being placed and removed from the quadrants of the field. We can conclude that the system responds to objects in the field and acts accordingly. All right, I'm David. Uh, I was in charge of the goose detection, which is a big part of the main application. So when the user sets up the system, he defines a region of interest. Uh, once he confirms that, the background is saved. Uh, from that point, every new frame coming from the camera gets subtracted from the saved background, generating a threshold image. Uh, this is done with a simple OpenCV function that basically takes two frames uh, and subtracts them pixel-wise. So pixels that are the same uh, turn black. Pixels that change are white. Uh, if we have blobs on the uh, threshold image, we know that there's an object on the field. Uh, that initiates the image to be sent to the AWS recognition service, which provides object detection. Uh, it takes an uh, image as an input and uh, returns a JSON file uh, listing uh, all objects detected on the image uh, along with the corresponding confidence score. Uh, on average, from request to receiving the file uh, was 10 seconds, uh, which is pretty good. And once we received the file, um, we scanned, scanned through it in, in search of uh, the word goose and uh, looked at the corresponding confidence score, and if it was high enough, uh, above 80 in our, in our uh, case, uh, we initiated a uh, sweep mission. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the iOS app now. Um, so the iOS app lets the user uh, set system parameters. So basically, uh, that will allow the user to map the field of interest. Um, and that's how we calculate coordinates later on. Um, so the other thing that the iOS app does is 
it uh, basically sends a request to the Raspberry Pi server, um, basically asking it either to open or close our hangar or get locations of the keys. Um, and once it gets feedback from the Raspberry Pi, it can either in initiate a DJI mission if necessary, um, or it could stay in the hangar if there's no geese. Um, and it'll basically respond according to what the Raspberry Pi uh, feedback is. Um, and the last thing that our customer wanted was user feedback. So our app lets you see the battery percentage of the drone, and it also uh, you can see the UI right there. It basically tells you which fields or which reg regions are of interest um, at a given time. So that uh, field UI will update dynamically based on how the locations of the geese change. Uh, so I was in charge of integrating the drone into the system. So due to our hardware choices of using uh, the DJI Phantom 3, we had to integrate the control of the drone into the iOS application. And uh, essentially, we used DJI's uh, extensive SDK to integrate the, uh, the control of the drone. So essentially, the drone is positioned using GPS coordinates, and that is passed already from uh, the Raspberry Pi inner system to the uh, iPhone app, and that is then available for me to use for sending the drone out on uh, DJI waypoint missions. Afterwards, I add a, a hot point action to each of these waypoint missions, which is essentially a radial orbit around the GPS coordinate, and we just specify the radius. And after all the after the mission is complete, the drone returns home back to the hangar. And uh, the hangar is fully integrated with the Raspberry Pi. That means the Raspberry Pi can automatically send it to open and close, depending on the uh, status of the system. And it also, one of the biggest requirements, like I mentioned before, was full, dr full drone protection. So the hangar is weatherproof to a wind, rain, and snow. So, And also, the uh, system does have uh, a Dark Skies API built into it, so it won't go out on a sweep if there's uh, uh, rain or wind or too much wind or sleet or something like that to uh, protect the drone, which isn't waterproof or anything. And uh, uh, hangar is also theft-proof up to like a reasonable amount. There's 300-pound pow linear actuators control the opening and closing of the doors. So unless you basically take like a sledgehammer and smash the thing open to get the drone, it's uh, safe from theft inside. It was fabricating, fabricated using a honeycomb composite material, which is super strong and lightweight, so it's pretty uh, perfect for this kind of application. And uh, it was controlled using an optically isolated four-channel relay module to control the linear actuators, basically just using that to flip the polarities to open and close it, and also control the uh, voltage to the linear actuators. And there's a 12-volt, uh, six-amp hour battery inside with a two-amp uh, trickle charger just to keep the system um, always powered. So the Raspberry Pi served as the central unifying uh, component for the entire system. The Raspberry Pi was directly connected to the camera through a port on the Raspberry Pi uh, with the iOS app through a server and a hangar through the GPI opens. The Raspberry Pi would run a main script that would call uh, the hangar door function, which would control the doors of the hangar, uh, the image processing functions when the system is active server uh, set up the server and establish communication between the Raspberry Pi and iOS app and uh, system active functions which would check when the system should be active and um, it would check things such as the weather uh, to determine if the drone is safe to fly or if the user uh, wants the system to be active during that time. So in, con in conclusion we were, we were able to uh, create a near autonomous system uh, that can be deployed just about anywhere. Um, and I just want to bring up like the possibilities for use uh, for combining like image image processing technology with a drone it can be used for security applications, uh, wildlife applications, and our our system can be easily modified for using uh, those types of applications. Lastly, I want to thank the professors, our customer, and the TAs for uh, helping us through throughout this project. Thanks, guys. Uh, so a question for you. So geese aren't like the center of the universe or anything, but they are wild animals um, and have their own migratory patterns and lifestyles and things like that. So I'm wondering if you guys looked at um, any like environmental regulations or anything. And I'm thinking, you know, if you had a ton of these, say, on like every soccer field in Massachusetts, like what impact would that have on the wildlife and if that's okay or not? I guess we didn't really look at too much of that. One thing we did when we did like some initial goose research 
uh, we kind of found that like there's other systems out there that are used for uh, like scaring away geese from fields. And most of the time, what happens with a system like that when they are successful, the geese just end up moving to an area close by, but not right on. So they, like they would end up just like moving like not even far away, like 200 yards away to a different spot where that's not affecting them. And then that's pretty much what we found for that. So we're assuming if this was deployed in a lot of locations, that would just happen. There probably wouldn't be too many like we're assuming though. I, I guess we didn't really look into that kind of thing too much. Cases though, like that actually, like those patterns actually disrupt the ability for the goose to breed. And even in those cases for those other systems, like those are illegal in Canada for that exact reason. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense, I guess. I don't know. It was, <laughs> this is more just like we were kind of getting the functionality going here. We didn't really oh, get that's, tested. That's, that's fair, that's fair. Yeah. But I mean, at least, at least you did the research to look into it. So I think the, the disclaimer is something to put on there is illegal. Don't yeah. use in like any circumstances. Right. For the record, I care less about geese. All right, I had another question. Um, so with the drone landing in the hangar, what it, is it difficult to l land it in the hangar, or is it land in, it's perfectly safe every time? Um, so luckily, because of DJI's SDK, they provide a go home function. So basically, it'll save the area the mission started at. Um, so basically, the way the system works is I'll command the hangar to open. Uh, using the iOS application, and then we'll wait for the completion. So we'll wait till the hangar doors are fully open, uh, and then we'll call the go home function. The go home functionality uses GPS coordinates, so it can't be extremely accurate, but it does land in the hangar. It's precise mm. enough to land in the hangar. And does it charge in the hangar? Uh, so that was one of the things we were looking into early on. The problem with current technology is that, yeah, drone specifically, uh, you can't charge the battery while it's inside the drone uh, because mm. of overheat issues. So uh, the only way to charge it would be to re manually remove the drone, or manually remove the battery. So mm. at that point, uh, human intervention is required no matter what. Uh, how long can the drone be powered? Yeah, how uh, many okay. missions? So DJI's battery life is actually higher than a lot of other drones. Uh, it's about 30 minutes. Uh, for our application, missions are fairly short. They usually don't take more than two minutes tops. So for us, we can go on 15 missions. And if the geese activity is fairly low, uh, that could last multiple days. Yep. Yeah, one question. So is your image detection algorithm only, does it detect any change, or did you specifically train it to detect geese? In other words, if a little kid runs out, is the drone going to attack him? Or? Excuse me. With the last part, what was the last part? Um, are you detecting any difference in the like in the images, or you, yeah, did you so train the algo to detect uh, you know outline of a geese specifically? Yeah, it's so it it takes uh, an image of the field every five minutes, sees, compares it, so does a background subtraction, so it compares it to an empty field. If there are objects, we send it through the AWS recognition system, and if that report give gives us a goose, we go on a mission. Otherwise, we we don't go for a mission. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, our next uh, next team is uh, team number two, uh, Auto Pen. They're the guys with the car that's sitting outside. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Geraldine. I'm Peter. I'm Osim. I'm Omar. I'm Dennis. And we are the creators of Auto Pen. So vehicles nowadays are becoming more and more connected. They're adding features such as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi capabilities. So while that sounds like all fun and games, that's only introducing more attack vectors to the vehicles. And take, for example, the Jeep hack that happened in 2015. All components of the vehicle communicate via the CAN network. A message is broadcasted to all electronic comp uh, control units, and the corresponding ECU receives it. Because there's no encryption on this network, any unit can send a message to another unit in the vehicle. So in the Jeep hack, researchers showed that they could send messages using just the computer to the CAN network, taking control over the steering wheel and causing something like this to happen. So to help prevent this, we worked together with our clients, Professor Starobinsky and Dr. Jonathan Petit from Volpe and Security Innovation to create an open source toolkit that's designed to help and assist security professionals, but also security novices, including and encompassing all of these tools that are used both specifically for cars, but then also some that are not for vehicles all in one place. Um, and so, so one thing that our clients communicated to us is that they spend so much time just trying to install these tools and they spend so much time just trying to find the dependencies that sometimes it fails. So our tool, what it does is that it automatically installs everything for them in the back end, um, including like the, the dependencies libraries, creating symbolic links, which I'll go into more detail later on. But in addition to that, we also make it um, friendly for people who don't understand security. So we include, as you can see, we include a tool description and also tutorials that are available for each tool so that if you're just picking this up for the first time, you'll be able to pretty much understand and get a gist of how things work. And on the right side, um, there's a tool that we created ourselves that our team member is gonna talk about later on that's called CanUtils-X. So now we will go into a quick video. This is the screen that the user will see once AutoPen is open. Once they click tools, they can see that all the tools are separated by category. So say for example, I wanted to install Wireshark. And then I would normally see an install button here, but we've already installed it in the background. So I have three options. I have open, update, or uninstall. Once I click open, you can see that Wireshark has opened in the background. So now we'll go into an example of actually using one of our tools named Can You Tills X. All right, our packet, so we're gonna have start. Our packet that is about to be injection through our GUI. We press start. Bam. So the following is a brief technical overview of AutoPen. AutoPen essentially serves as a software wrapper for a large number of tools, an enormous number of dependencies and libraries that are necessary to run these tools, and a significant amount of persistent data storage uh, to collect and permanently store uh, CAN data and network traffic, which is collected on the network. Ubuntu is required to run AutoPen, preferably a dedicated install as opposed to a virtual machine. And AutoPen also has the functionality to interface with the wired and wireless connectors on the car, including the OBD2 ports, the software-defined radios, the Bluetooths, and all the Wi-Fi connectivities of the car. So as we said before, the GUI is based off the Kivi GUI library, and so when you I open the application, you, there's the welcome page, which displays the tools, the how-to, uh, and about AutoPen, and the terms and conditions. And once you click tools, you have four, the four different categories, which is CAN, SDR, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and miscellaneous. And uh, you can uh, click these tool, click these each of these categories, and it'll display the list of tools under each category. Or you can s use the search bar above to uh, so specifically search for that tool. And uh, finally at the bottom, you can select all tools to selectively install which tools you want in case you just want like a specific amount of tools. And so kind of just to get a general overview on how that works, the user will begin by opening AutoPen. 
And in uh, the first script that runs, it installs commands such as git, curl, and pip, which are commands that I need in the background to be able to install these tools um, automatically. And so once you go through the whole process of selecting the tool and, and which one you want to install, then the question is, did it install? And so if it installs successfully, you get three options. You can either open the tool, update the tool, or uninstall the tool. And if all three of those work, um, if open and update work, then you'll be able to open the tool. And if uninstall work, then you'll get the option to install the tool again. Now, if it doesn't work, what I do is that I create a file that's called log.txt, which basically just stores all of the output that terminal um, is producing, which is kind of just like your computer just without the GUI. Um, and so that way it just makes it easier for people to be able to see what errors and where um, things failed and what's going on. But I also include print statements for people, like I said, who are not security friendly um, so that they can just see like this stopped at this spot and you know they can try to kind of figure that out themselves and restart the app and hopefully that'll help. Um, but another thing that I do is also now the question is what happens when you open the tool a second time? Do you really want to go through the process of installing it again and, and not knowing which tools are installed or not? So the very first time that you open the tool, I create a uh, file that's called install.txt where I basically write into it all the tools that you install and I remove all the tools that are uninstalled so the second time that you open the tool, I look for that text file and see, is it there? And if it is, I read it all in and change the buttons accordingly. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My job was to develop an open source application for interfacing with um, the main internal data bus of uh, most modern vehicles, the CAN bus. Um, so the CAN bus is what um, most ECUs in the vehicle, like the ECUs for um, the engine or the headlights, use to communicate um, with each other and with the main control unit of the vehicle. And so um, what this uh, application does, so, the, so all you have to do is plug, set up a network interface with whatever OBD2 dongle that you use to plug into your car and to your laptop. And once you're connected, you can perform um, live network monitoring so you can see all the traffic coming in. And you can perform all different kinds of um, statistical analyses of this traffic. Um, if you're um, uh, looking to uh, monitor specific bytes that are coming in from a specific ECU that represent some value that tell you something about the vehicle, like the RPM of the engine or um, as such, and other uh, cybersecurity um, pen testing features like bus fuzzing, where you can send random packets and try to crash your car, or um, fuzz a specific ECU, or just like injection of packets that you know uh, perform, uh, you know, speak to a certain ECU and perform some kind of specific action in the vehicle. Um, so, next slide, um, this is just like the main interface of this application where on the right um, you can see, you know, all the traffic coming in. Um, and you can filter through specific traffic or tag specific arbitration IDs, which, which um, you know, uh, designate you know, specific ECUs. Or uh, and on the left, um, you can see your visualization of whatever analysis you're performing on, um, some, uh, on traffic coming in from some specific ECU. And then you can, on the bottom, you can um, select one of the many features for um, the pen testing. So because the CAN bus is unencrypted, they use security through obscurity, which means that every car, every trim, every maker, everybody has a different way of telling you where messages are going and where they're coming from. So arbitration IDs, which are the destination of a message, are completely random in essence. And for reverse engineering and for penetration testing, having a knowledge of how the car is working under the hood and how these messages moving along or move along is critical. So therefore, persistent storage of this data is incredibly important because when you have well-tagged metadata, based on the car of where it's coming from, you can perform analysis on this and learn which messages correspond to what physical actions on the car. And this will allow you to further understand your knowledge of the car and build better intrusion detection systems. Um, so in addition to the internal data bus that um, allows people to communicate or allows the car to communicate um, internally using the CAN data, there's also um, SDR, which is basically the wireless uh, interface that um, allows a lot of these um, uh, EC or a lot of these components to communicate wirelessly. For example, for example, the key fob and um, the key fob. Uh, so basically, what we worked on was um, uh, so setting up the. Um, so we basically included templates that allow users to um, that would allow a user to come in and uh, tune tune the template um, using GNU Radio and then replicate that attack um, that we actually successfully were able to execute. As if you'd call it successful, we basically um, um, hacked, the, ha hacked the car key and it wasn't working. So we've included that template and we've done other testing, but um, so that's the template that we're including. And we also added um, tutorials for a lot of the packages to um, for users to execute. Um,
conclude, I'd like to note that as uh, vehicles become increasingly connected to the external, uh, the internal vehicles become incre increasingly connected to the external vehicles that we interact with, it becomes of utmost importance to for researchers to find security holes and patch these holes. And so we hope that this platform and this, um, this the project that we have provided um, facilitates uh, the ease of use and setup of this of these tools for newcomers to the field, as well as information sharing between um, industry professionals um, in order to perform um, analysis on a more abstract scale when we have a lot of information. And I'd like to thank Professor Sarabinsky and Dr. Uh, Petit for mentoring us during this process and supporting us, as well as everyone from the Volpe facility over there. Um, thank you for your, <laughs> for your support and for your, for your patience and time. And uh, thank you to our senior design mentors, um, Professor Bersano and El Sheikh. Thank you so much. I have two questions, and none of them involve puns. Um, this is super valuable. Like, this is extremely important that people that I don't think a toolkit like this, or at least I don't know of one that exists for cars. Are, are you guys the first? You are. Okay. <laughs> Great. Good answer. Um, so then, my second question is like, have you like taken some of the learnings from some of the other attack platforms that exist out there for like desktop computers and mobile phones, where they show um, previous vulnerabilities and how they were attacked, or how they were attacked previously, and basically let researchers string together strings of different vulnerabilities to kind of show how, like, you can craft a new attack. Do you have like capabilities like that? Like, you could show me how the Jeep hack worked, so that I can craft that hack for, I don't know, my car. So I think the way that our tool works is that it's mostly just giving you access to all these tools. And so with the tutorials, our hope is that you will be able to kind of get a gist of how things work. Um, I know, for example, like Omar's tool, it does include penetration testing capabilities. Um, so you will be able to kind of like inject those packets the same way that the G pack did. Um, kind of build upon that, using the G pass hack as an example, everything you need to have to execute a similar attack or different types of attacks is included in this. So if you knew exactly how you wanted to attack the vehicle and how you wanted to approach exploiting a certain vector of vulnerability, or even just finding a new one and exploiting that, you'd have the capability to do so. Gotcha. So it's something like, like Minnesota. And then my last question, which is super quick. Uh, is this going to be registered on APT? What? Like, can I have get this? Yes. Oh. Um, uh, I think for right now, it's accessible via our GitHub. <laughs> okay. um, but hopefully, we will make it. Yeah, it. yeah. That is our goal, is to make it into a package tool so that people won't have to install certain dependencies that they need to run our tool. But there is a script, because when you run it on the VM, it's a little more complicated, but we have a script that you just run and we handle all that dependency work for you, if you were to run on a VM. Um, so, so basically, the attack that we used was the replay attack, and um, we used GNU Radio. And you and, and and using that replay attack through um, there were some modules that were already um, part of the GNU radio that that we just included in our tool and then um, so the template uh, is there and when we executed the the key the key fob stopped working so we we actually like um, so, so so that that um, so we include that template and we can't really replicate it unless you want to break the key again so yeah so. Uh, Speaking more on that, so basically the, the key fob itself, uh, is, it's still completely functional, it's just that the button presses don't actually do anything. It, you, you can still see the signal. Uh, we know of, t currently we don't have the equipment to have tested any of this, but uh, the recently uh, Chinese hackers actually developed uh, $20 tools to be able to attack, uh, basically extend the range of a key fob and effectively s steal a car while it's like just parked there, and, w and while like you're like 200 meters away, and uh, yeah. So, uh, but you essentially you need two devices that can both transmit and receive at the same time, and at two different frequencies. I think it was at 315 and 112. No, no, 125, 125 kilohertz. Uh, and yeah, so uh, c currently we didn't have we didn't really have the uh, hardware to test that out, but uh, yeah, it's it's technically possible with our toolkit.
phase. Uh, uh, Volpe Transportation was very nice to drive uh, the test vehicle here. It's sitting on the patio uh, outside on the Cummington Mall under a tent due to the weather. So uh, those of you who are interested, make sure you look at the car and the students will be set up showing you what they're doing and you can ask whatever questions you want, additional questions at that time. Okay, our last uh, uh, last team of this session before we take a break is team number 16, Guardian. Hi, everyone. Um, we're teams running safety, and from your right to your left is Alexandra, Chris, Nikita, I'm Rosie, and Ina. And um, our client's name is Isabel Fasano, and our product is called Guardian. So one of the major concerns for outdoor running is their safety. And over the past year, there's been many incidences where people would go out for a run and wouldn't be able to return home safely. And here are a few headlines that we found. So, <coughs> um, so all these headlines are pretty horrifying to imagine. And, but the truth is, it can happen to anyone at any time. And that's part of the reason, that's the, um, and these, these incidences are the reason why, uh, what inspired our product. So as Rosie just highlighted in these disturbing headlines, there's a real need for more safety while running outside. So as an avid runner myself, I usually like to run by outside myself as well. So with the 34% of Americans that feel afraid while exercising outdoors, this is just unacceptable when you're trying to do something that is for the betterment of yourself. So with um, the 40% of people that feel that their safety is increased when they're running with others, this is where our device comes in to help be that other person. Yes, so um, as Alex said, our device guardian will make sure that runners never feel alone or unsafe when outdoors. Um, so the device will help contact help um, with either um, a contact information or um, 911. So um, the device itself is a small circuit board that has one button as the input and two LEDs to display the modes. Um, it pairs up with the phone um, via Bluetooth and I guess the location of the phone through Bluetooth as well. Um, the, Bluetooth, um, the location is updating constantly um, to make sure that the location is up to date. And in case the phone gets lost or broken or stolen, uh, the latest information will still be stored in the database so that when the phone is disconnected, uh, the emergency contact will get a text saying that the phone is disconnected, but here's the latest location that was sold the runner. Um, yes, it's also paired with Android mobile application and a web application to make sure that tracking the runner is as easy as possible for anybody. So here's a quick visualization of how our product works, a technical overview basically. In the upper corner, you'll see the pink armband that's worn by the runner when you're outside exercising. This contains our physical device, device which is shown directly below it in the diagram. Um, the physical device consists of an Arduino microcontroller, an A6 GSM modem that sends our emergency text messages, and a, an HCO6 Bluetooth module that communicates with our smartphone. Now, when the button is pressed on our device, it sends an alert, via the, uh, an alert via the cellular network, which, depending on which mode was triggered, either sends an alert message to your emergency contact or to 911 dispatch, or both, uh, as well as the smartphone is constantly getting your physical location via G GPS from inside the phone, which can be tracked on the mobile application. This information is also shared with our backend database, which can be accessed from the web application or the mobile application by emergency contact users so that they can track the runners that have given them their information while they're using our device. Now we'll show you a quick video of the device in action. To use our application, the user registers either as a runner or an emergency contact to enter the information and log in and pair the device with their phone. 
Now it's start and they're ready to go. First mode is to text an emergency contact by holding down the button and to cancel the text, continue holding this button. Second mode is to contact 911 by pressing this button quickly. Hold down to cancel. The emergency contact will get a text message indicating that the runner is in danger with the coordinates of where the runner is currently and they can either use their phone or the companion web application to look up the location. So for individual contributions, I was on the hardware team with Alex and Ina, and and um, so basically, for the first step, to, the first step in deciding our final product was to determine what modules were feasible to include. So what our final product included a Bluetooth module which will connect to the user's Android device, a GSM module which is responsible for sending out the emergency text messages and Arduino that acts as a processor for everything. And we have one button that will allow for user interaction and uh, LEDs for debugging purposes as well as to indicate what mode the buttons are in. Um, so as part of the hardware team, I mostly worked on integrating the GSM module, which was responsible for sending the actual text messages. So it was extremely important to get that functioning perfectly. Um, I was also responsible for the button modes. So as you saw in a video, there are two modes. And just to clarify some things, um, in case the user feels really stressed and just keeps pressing the button constantly, instead of sending the 911 alert a thousand times and canceling it a thousand times, we just send it once. Then we give the user five seconds to cancel so that they cannot cancel it by accident. So we got some logic into it so that um, nothing can be done by accident, basically. Um, I was also a part of the device team with Rosie and Ina, and I worked mainly on uh, putting together the circuits and like soldering it all into that proto board, as you can see on the slide. Um, I also mainly worked with uh, Bluetooth communication, so how the device interacts with our phone. So any data that was taken from the phone, I would parse it through Arduino code and be able to send any location like the latitude, longitude, and things like that to the user. That way the emergency contact can get it as well. Um, I was also a part of the software team a little bit by designing the website, as you guys saw in the video. So now that we took you through the device side of it, uh, Chris and Nikita are going to take you through the software side. So my primary responsibility for the project was the development of our mobile application, which we developed for the Android platform. Uh, primarily, as you guys saw in the video, the way that the experience works is you'll log in either as a runner user, which is our primary focus for the app, or an emergency contact who can use the app to locate their associated runner. So when you're a runner and you log in, you'll see a first page, you'll see you'll be able to connect to your device via Bluetooth, which is set up to be made easy for you. And then the picture in picture you saw during the uh, video we showed shows the main screen, which has uh, is mostly taken up by a Google Maps uh, fragment, which shows the current location of, user, of the user, as well as uh, certain options to allow um, uh, experience uh, customization as well as the current latitude and longitude so it's always available to you. Additionally, uh, everything that can be done from the physical device can be done with our mobile application so that you can quickly send an emergency text from your phone with the most up-to-date coordinates or as well as call forwarding which can immediately dial 911 or your emergency contact. Additionally, every so often, every uh, several location updates, we send both the information to our database and to our physical device so that when the button is pushed, it has up-to-date information. Finally, I'll pass it off to Nikita, who will talk about our back end. So our main application was the Android application, but we also had a companion um, web application. I was responsible for the back end, um, user authorization, and um, the da uh, database, as well as the app flow. I chose Firebase as the database because it is uh, uh, NoSQL and it is um, uh, a real time, which is really helpful for us because we need uh, the coordinates to update as fast as possible, especially in an emergency situation when we're handing it off to um, or sending a text message with the coordinates itself. Um, when it came to app flow, I wanted to make it as seamless as possible, especially with um, um, 
because we're using it in stressful situations and we want uh, it to guide you through that situation. Um, in conclusion, we truly believe that with our application, you are never alone with our device. Um, you can, uh, with the statistics shared earlier, we feel that you'll be able to run alone safely. Um, in addition, with, uh, we stand out from other devices currently out there like Life Alert because we have a robust software along with our hardware. The two in companion can have other use cases such as maybe a child uh, walking alone from school or an elderly par uh, parent living home alone. We just want to thank our professors, Professor Pisano and Al Sheikh, for their time and uh, support this year, as well as our customer, Isabel Pisano. Thank you for dedicating your time and coming along and helping us with this project. So often, like, so if your house is, if I'm a burglar and I go, like, try to knock on the door of a house, like, the first thing I'll do is, like, ring the doorbell. And then, like, if a dog barks, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to mess with this dog, and I'm going to go away. Um, did you consider any sort of deterrence for the attacker to immediately serve the attacker's need, the victim's needs? Uh, so are you speaking, like, some kind of, like, Like an air horn or something yeah, okay. that is so attached to your person? That actually, the primary motivation for this project was to keep something on you that wouldn't be immediately taken away. So when we talked about this with our customer at the beginning of the process, she described to us that she wanted something that was discreet rather than uh, a loud deterrent because we, uh, we figured that the first thing an assailant would do in an effort to silence your ability to call for help is to take away your cell phone. So this device sort of acts as a backup. I mean, most likely if you have the time, you're likely to want to call rather than, but what this does is it discreetly sends your exact position as well as so that if your cell phone is taken away, that this device still manages to get on an emergency alert. So it's kind of, the secondary and more like a contingency plan, but that way it immediately sends all the information in a direct and accessible format so that you don't have to type out or try and ramble off where you are if you're in danger. Okay. Thanks. Um, so let's say like long term way out, this product gets huge, like everyone has one, literally everyone knows how to use it. Um, I'm out running, someone wants to attack me and they know how to use it. That doesn't help me much anymore. So. Thinking from a business perspective, what can you do long term to make sure something like that wouldn't happen? So it's still useful in solving my problem, um, but it protects me. Maybe make it in different forms, make it more invisible. Like the one we saw online was a ring that is totally invisible. Everybody wears rings, but you don't know that there is a button on it. So maybe like a necklace, a ring, or anything it can take different shapes. Additionally, the, uh, the cancellation of the text message has to be very quick. Um, like we said, like once you hit that button for the 911 uh, text message to go out, unless you know you immediately want to cancel it, you have less than five seconds to make sure that text doesn't go out because we wanted to make sure that the info is sent as quickly as possible. So if you make a mistake, you, you better know. Um, this might result in a few more false positives than we'd like, but at the same time, it kind of prevents that cancellation after the fact because the information will likely go out. Um, so if you don't recognize your mistake, that text message will be gone and on its way to the rece recipient within five to seven seconds tops. Um, so you're running, you're sweating profusely. Uh, most people do at least. Uh, did you, what did you look into for covering of the device? Uh, we looked into like 3D printing a case for it, but we used a plexiglass case instead so that it could fit into the armband and that way when, when you run, it just like, I mean, you do get sweaty and stuff like that. So, um, and we used the armband because that has like, you know, another layer to it in that sense. And so that way like it does protect like all the wiring with it as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add something to the running part of it. This is not just made for runners, even though you can put it in the armband, it can also be put in the pocket or a purse, anywhere you can reach it. So if you go for a walk, you're not feeling safe, you can also take your device. You don't have to be a runner. <laughs> okay, we are now at a point where we're gonna take a break. I would like, let's see if we can hold a break till five minutes. Uh, it's about 26 minutes after two now. Maybe we can start again shortly after 2.30. Uh,